How do you do? My name is Gus Gazard, Professor of Ophthalmology here at UCL in London and Director of the Glaucoma Service at Moorfields Eye Hospital, also in London. Today we're talking about the role of glaucoma laser and the solutions that that can bring to some of the problems we have with pressure lowering for our glaucoma patients. So the symposium is titled Towards a Dropless Future. We have 45 minutes with three speakers, myself, uh, Professor Florent Attel and Mark Latina. The problems that we face with glaucoma are the particular problems of um, drop side effects, drop use, and the difficulties of ever really knowing whether our patients use their medications. But what's exciting about the uh, support and evidence base now is that there is a, an increasing uh, appetite for uh, drop-free um, and drop-independent, medication-independent ways of lowering eye pressure and treating our patients. And laser, I think, is going to be the mainstay of that, both selective laser trabeculoplasty and also other forms of uh, ciliary body ablation, such as subcyclo laser. The first talk will be from myself. And I'll be talking about why SLT should be first line treatment. The second talk will be from Professor Florent Aptel, looking at subcyclo, the concept, and the benefits to our patients. Is this a safe alternative to glaucoma surgery? And lastly, Mark Latina, the inventor of SLT laser many years ago, will talk about where to rank laser and where to position laser in our glaucoma armamentarium. So on to our first talk today, I'm gonna to be talking about the role of selective laser trabeculoplasty or SLT as a primary laser therapy. Should it be the treatment that we reach for first for our open angle glaucoma patients, ocular hypertensive requiring treatment? So I have some funding acknowledgements, primarily that I'm funded by the NHS research wing, the NIHR, to conduct a large uh, randomized controlled trial of SLT. And this study had its initial three-year outcome published in The Lancet in 2019. And it's a study that has looked at SLT compared to eye drops for the first line treatment of the patients we mentioned, OHT and primary open angle glaucoma. And this was a multi-center randomized controlled trial. The traditional treatment experience for most patients is eye drops, then more eye drops and switch to different eye drops and side effects with those eye drops. And eventually many of them come to have in surgery. And even in treatment and under treatment, sadly, many of those patients lose vision. And there may be a reason for that. Probably is that many patients don't take the eye drops that we think they're taking. And even when they are taking them, they don't take them frequently enough, and they certainly don't take them every day. So what's wrong with medical treatment? Well, primarily what I've just said, the compliance or persistence and adherence problem. Some studies show that 33% of patients discontinue their drops in the first year. And even if they do take them, 10% don't respond at all to various medications, both beta blockers and prostaglandins, and the effects themselves can wear off, the so-called tachyphylaxis. And then on top of that, if you do take the drops, many of them lead to reduced surgical success rates later on in life. So if you do ultimately need glaucoma surgery, if you've been taking your drops for many years, then you may well have a lower success rate for your trabeculectomy or bleb forming surgery. And of course, they also cost not just the drugs themselves, but the number of visits and switches between medications. So an alternative to that, which has been around for many years, is the SLT laser invented by Mark Latina and described in the original pilot study. It's a Q-switch, a very, very short three nanosecond pulse switched laser using a frequency double YAG of 532 nanometer visible wavelength light with a fixed spot size and variable energy. And you just look for fine bubbles appearing as an endpoint when you look at the trabecular meshwork through a, um, a gurneoscopy lens. And it's painless, takes about five minutes an eye, if that, uh, and has a very, very, uh, not just good success rate, but very good safety profile. 
It replaced the old argon laser that produced large punched out burns in the trabecular meshwork on these elect scanning electron micrographs with a very uh, low energy density that was rapidly dissipated and rapidly dispersed within the tissues, leading to a, an influx of macrophage monocytes, but very, very little actual tissue destruction, which means that it's generating a very, very weak localized inflammatory process that then seems to help to clear and regenerate the trabecular meshwork without causing permanent damage, or if there is, it's very little and it's very subtle. Uh, Alvarado's work in the States, um, extensive animal and tissue culture work, led to a hypothesis that the SLT was stimulating in the immediate and short term a cytokine release that led to the monocyte recruitment um, and also an activation of existing trabecular meshwork cells and stimulation of phagocytic activity, and also a stimulation of Schlem's canal endothelium uh, conductivity, such that the outflow resistance dropped and that you could get a lowering of interocular pressure almost immediately, but also that you were generating long-term trabecular meshwork changes because of the phagocytic activity of the existing cells, the newly recruited cells, and probably a cellular repopulation of a, what we know to be normally a, a depopulated trabecular meshwork that's lost some of its cellularity. And Luton Dracol's work and others have suggested that there may even be an increased division of existing um, trabecular meshwork stem cell precursors that contribute to that repopulation of the trabecular meshwork. So there's lots of supportive evidence. Does it work? Well, we conducted the LIGHT trial in 718 uh, patients across six centers. We had initially five extending to eight years of study. Um, uh, we had published the three-year outcomes uh, that I'll show you, and we're preparing the six-year outcomes now. These were newly diagnosed, treatment naive, never previously treated for um, ophthalmic condition patients. They only had glaucoma ocular hypertension. We excluded comorbidities and we looked at quality of life and clinical outcomes. And our objectives, well, primarily, it was whether, whether the SLT would deliver a health-related quality of life superior to drops. And secondarily, whether it would cost less or as much as medicine and whether it would achieve the same target pressures. We used decision support software to guide some of our decisions to maintain the objectivity. And we had masked observers for um, almost all of the clinical examinations, such as intraocular pressure and those conducting the visual field test or nerve scan. This decision support software helped with the uh, task of stratifying the patients by severity, defining an individual eye specific target intraocular pressure, detection of disease progression using visual fields and glaucoma progression algorithms, as well as um, triggering or suggesting treatment escalations and changes in follow up interval. We had severity classified by um, mean deviation and central visual field loss according to published criteria. We had target intraocular pressure also set according to published criteria with more stringent targets for more severely affected disease, as you would expect, because that's what we do in clinical practice. We had an incremental escalation of um, treatment according to standardized practice and standardized flow charts where we had SLT first up to twice in the laser first pathway and medication um, following a recommended uh, pattern of medication use following the European Glaucoma Society guidelines of prostaglandins first and then beta blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors and alpha agonists and ultimately surgery if necessary. We followed a standardized laser protocol where we treated 306 degrees with 100 shots through a non-magnifying lens, increasing in small increments from a very low pressure until we saw the clinical endpoint where at least 50% of shots had to have a visible bubble formation, but without the free streams of bubbles that very high pressures sometimes generate. And then they had ocular um, if and only if they suffered pain. So they took a bottle home, but they didn't need to use it unless they wanted it. We randomized 718 patients. We screened several thousand because those patients often had were re-referrals who'd previously been treated, or they had other diseases, they had cataract or diabetes, and they weren't um, therefore weren't eligible because we wanted really um, 
entirely treatment naive patients. And of those, we managed to retain 91% at three years. And of those, around three quarters had mild to moderate glaucoma. And of the glaucomas, um, two thirds were definitely mild. So the results. The clinical outcomes of vision, pressure, mean deviation, number of clinic visits were comparable between the two arms. The pressure reduction at two months was the same between the two arms. This was the last point we, I, I present the two month data because it's the last point at which we um, had a, a pure pressure response with no additional um, treatment added. If we look at the number of visits, so we're reaching that target pressure, that was slightly higher for the laser first group. And in terms of visual field and disc progressions, the laser group did better. There were more disease deterioration as predefined by our GPA and disc analysis in the medicine first group. Cataract extractions were comparable, but the trabeculectomy rates were very different. In the medicine first group, 11 subjects needed trabeculectomy, whereas in the laser first group, none did. Treatment escalations, as you'd expect from that data, were, uh, re were required more often in the medicine first group. Fewer of them were controlled, more of them needed more treatment. We saw comparable numbers, slightly greater in the DROPS group of cataract extractions right the way throughout six years now. And the cumulative trabeculectomy rate, which at three years was 11 nil, continued to diverge and continued to be much greater in, greater in the drops arm with almost 30 terechelectomies in the drops arm and just a handful in the laser group. Returning now to three-year data, these are the published three-year data um, from the primary paper where we found that 78% of individual eyes were reaching their preset eye-specific target pressure without medication at three years when they had laser. So that means that over three quarters of eyes, and as it happens, three quarters of patients were drop free at target with laser alone at three years. We're currently analyzing the six year data, and it looks as though in a very significant proportion of patients, a very significant number are still in this pressure controlled drop free group at their target pressure with laser alone right the way throughout to six years. And I certainly have patients clinically in my clinic who have been now controlled for eight or 10 years without medication. And three quarters of these eyes needed only one SLT. We had very sa um, good laser safety with only one pressure spike. The pressure reduction was um, partly related to total power, but primarily related to how high the pressure was at baseline. So if you have a very high pressure, you got a large pressure reduction. We also looked at whether you could repeat SLT in this paper published in Ophthalmology using predefined retreatment criteria. And we find, found that if you took um, a group that failed within 18 months, that's the blue line of initial SLT, if you retreated them and followed them for a further 18 months, that over 60% of that group were still controlled 18 months later. So if you failed in a year and a half and had more laser, a year and a half later, a lot of those patients were still controlled. So the second laser worked better, worked longer than the first laser. It was almost as if we'd just got them over the initial hump. So repeat laser successfully reduced pressure and lasted longer. We also looked at visual field outcomes in over 11,000 visual fields of um, almost 700 patients. And we found that the visual field preservation was better for the laser group, even though they were treated to the same target pressure. The drops first group had more fast progressing eyes or fast progressing locations with some very complex statistics to correct for repeat analyses and collinearity. But we found that laser first group had better field preservation. It was also in the NHS UK setting, cheaper to do laser first overall than it was to do drops. So I would maintain that we should be offering SLT as a primary treatment to all newly diagnosed glaucoma and optical hypertensive patients. We should probably also be considering it as a replacement treatment for anyone who's not happy on multiple drops. 
and you can successfully repeat it. So it also has a role in secondary glaucomas and it's probably less useful for patients who are uncontrolled on multiple medications where moving on to more surgical treatments is probably more appropriate. So thanks to those who um, helped with this study of which there's a very long, uh, long list, um, most of whom are on this slide here. Um, thanks to you for listening and we'll move on to our next speaker in just a second. Thank you. I'd like to introduce Florence Abtel, the professor at the um, Joseph Fourier University, uh, Department of Ophthalmology in Grenoble. He's been using subcyclo, subliminal, subthreshold cyclophotocoagulation for many years now, and has a tremendous amount of experience in both subcyclo and selective laser trabeculoplasty lasers. He's going to talk to us about subcyclo techniques, and I look forward to his talk now. Thank you. So thank you to the team of Contel for your invitation, and I'm, I'm going to talk about the interest of the subcyclodiode laser to treat glaucoma, and particularly to the possibility to use it as an alternative to the glaucoma filtering surgeries. So my financial disclosures. So I have four parts in my presentation. Firstly, why a new technique of ciliary body coagulation was developed. As you know, we have many physical methods available to coagulate the ciliary body, and likely the most used until today is the conventional diode laser, TCPC. So the TCPC is efficient to reduce the IOP, but the conventional diode laser could have two limitations. Firstly, uh, the relationship between the dose and the effect is not predictable or poorly predictable. And as you can see in the published studies, because of that, we have urge variability in the IOP decrease after a diode TCPC. And you have a risk of very low IOP of ocular phthisis. And the second limitation of the diode TCPC is the safety profile. Also, as you can see in the published studies, we can have a lot of serious side effects after a diode TCPC. And because of that, we can have a definitive decrease in visual acuity. So for these reasons, Usually, we don't use the diode TCPC as an alternative to the glaucoma filtering surgeries. And for example, you can see some English colleagues have evaluated the possibility to use the diode TCPC in patients with moderate glaucoma with a good visual function before the filtering surgeries. In the white part of the, the slide, we have in black the pre-laser visual acuity. We have increased the post laser visual acuity. And as you can see, the visual acuities were between 3 to 10 and 10 to 10 before the diode laser TCPC. And some of the patients had no light perception, just light perception or head motion after the diode TCPC. So we have a large decrease in the visual acuity. So definitively, we cannot use a conventional diode laser in patients with early or moderate glaucoma and a good visual function. So, what are the physical principles of the new subcyclodiode laser? This laser still targets the cellular body and particularly targets the pigmented part of the cellular body, the cellular processes and cellular stroma. When we do a conventional diode laser during all the duration of the shot, we have delivery of energy to the tissue. So we have an eating of the tissue and we have a coagulation necrosis of the cellular body treated. When we do, by contrast, a subcyclodiode laser, we have some periods of shot, we have some periods of rest, and because of that, we do not have any eating of the tissue, and we do not have any coagulation of the tissue. And it is likely that the main mechanism of action of the subcyclodiode laser is not a decrease of the aqueous production, but instead of that is an increase of the aqueous outflow by the vascular pathway. And if we look in details, we have some periods of 0.5 milliseconds of shot and 1.1 milliseconds of rest, and that is the reason why we do not have any eating of the tissue. If we look, for example, the ciliary body after a conventional diode laser, we have a coagulation necrosis, so we can uh, see a whitening of the tissue of the ciliary processes. If we look the ciliary body before and after a subcyclodiode laser, we do not have any coagulation necrosis, so there is no whitening of the tissue, but instead there is a retraction of the ciliary body and likely an opening of the uvascular pathway. And that is the reason likely of the best uh, safety profile of the subcyclodiode laser.
So the public studies, what could be the results and what could be the best indication of the subcyclodiode laser? Actually, many uh, studies uh, have evaluated the subcyclodiode laser and have been published. In most of these studies, the power was 2000 milliwatts and the duration of shot was 80 seconds per hemisphere. So 80 seconds inferior and 80 seconds uh, superior. So I'm going to show you two studies that are very interesting. The first one was uh, conducted in Asia. It was a comparative study. We have one group treated with a conventional diode laser and one group treated with a subcyclodiode laser. We have different types of glaucoma, primary and secondary glaucoma. In terms of efficacy, in the table that you can see, we have the pre-laser IOP and the post-laser IOP with 18 months of follow-up. And as you can see, we had the same IOP before in the two groups and the same IOP after the two groups. So the ability uh, to reduce the IOP of the subcyclodiode laser was comparable, was the same than the ability of uh, the conventional diode laser. In this graph, very interesting, we have the relationship between the pre-laser and post-laser IOP. Each point is one given patient. In white, we have the conventional diode laser. In blue, we have the subcyclodiode laser. And as you can see, the IOP decrease is much more predictable with the subcyclodiode laser than it is with the conventional diode laser. And also, as you can see, we have some patients with very low IOP, hypotony and maybe phthidis with the conventional diode laser. We don't have patients with very low IOP with the subcyclodiode laser. The safety profile, without any doubts, is much, much better with the subcyclodiode laser. As you can see, 80% of the patients did not have any complication after a subcyclodiode laser. By contrast, after the conventional diode laser, most of the patients had some uh, side effects and sometimes inflammation, ocular phthisis, scleral burns, decrease in visual acuity. So definitely the safety profile is much, much better with the new modalities of subcyclo. The second study that I want to show you is a study uh, done in the Middle East. It was a large study, 71 eyes treated, patients with primary and secondary glaucoma. And I just want to show you one slide about the safety profile. This is a change in visual acuity, one year, one year 12 months, after the subcyclodiode laser. In the middle of the graph, no change. In the left part of the graph, decrease in visual acuity. And in the right part of the graph, increase in visual acuity. And as you can see, uh, a decrease in visual acuity is very uncommon after a subcyclodiode laser. And this confirms that the safety profile of the new subcyclodiode laser is usually very good. So to conclude, what could be the place of the subcyclodiode laser? Is this an alternative uh, to the glaucoma filtering surgery? Firstly, because the ability to reduce the IOP could be comparable to the ability of the conventional diode laser, I think that we can still use that in patients with refractory and very advanced glaucoma. Filtering surgery failure, neovascular, traumatic, affective glaucoma, or after vitro-retinal surgery. But also, as the safety profile of the subcyclodiode laser is good, I think that we can also use that in patients with early or moderate glaucoma as an alternative to the glaucoma surgery in patients in which we want to avoid a trabeculectomy or a diphtectomy. For, for example, bad compliance with the medication, ocular, ocular surface diseases, patients with cataract surgery, we can combine uh, subcyclo and cataract surgeries and also patient with highly myopic eye. Just to finish, I have three cases to uh, illustrate the large variability of indication of the subcyclo. The first one was a patient, uh, 68 years old uh, man with progressive glaucoma. The IUP was 22 and 23 with three medications. And as you can see with the visual field, it was a patient with progressive glaucoma. In the first eye, I did a trabeculectomy four years ago. It was not very successful. I had a leakage. Uh, the IUP was very low, and I had to put some suture again. And maybe because of that, it was not successful. And actually, six months after the trabeculectomy, the bleb was almost flat. The IUP was 22 with two medications, but the visual acuity was still good. 20 to 20. So I have decided to do a subcyclodiode laser, 100 seconds of shot per hemisphere. And you can see here the IOP uh, with 18 months of follow-up. And actually the result is very good. The IOP is now only 16 with two medications and without visual field progression and without decrease in visual acuity. The second case is, it was a 71 years old man. It was a very advanced glaucoma 
IUP is 31 and 34 with four medication. And as you can see, we have a major inflammation of the ocular surface. So I wanted to avoid to do a trabeculectomy because the risk of fibrosis of the blood likely was very high. So I do, I did a subcyclo diode laser. The IOP was very high. So I did 120 seconds of shot per hemisphere. And as you can see, this was successful. One year after the IOP was only 15 with just one medication. And as I was able to decrease the number of medication, I had a large improvement in the ocular surface, as you can see on the pictures. And finally, my last case is 78 years old man with angle plus of glaucoma. You can see the gonioscopic examination. The IOP was 25 and 27 with a PG analog. And so I have decided to do a combined surgery, cataract and subcyclo diode laser at the same time. This was successful. The IOP is now only 17 and 18 without medication and no progression of glaucoma. So, of course, we also have uh, the effect of the cataract surgery, but we also have the effect of the subcyclo, and the two combine uh, allows to have a very large decrease in IOP, and we can easily combine the two surgeries. So, to answer to the question, yes, definitively, I think that the subcyclo diode laser could be an alternative to the glaucoma filtering surgery. In patients in which we want to avoid the glaucoma filtering surgery, advanced glaucoma, previous uh, glaucoma filtering surgery failure, anterior surface inflammation, or patient with a risk of complication, highly myopic, aphakic, pediatric glaucoma, and also we can do that in patients with moderate glaucoma, in uh, which GIOP is not too high, we can decrease the parameters of the subcyclo diode laser, and we can do that as an alternative to the glaucoma surgery. And the last possibility is the combination with cataract surgery. If you had to do a cataract surgery in patients with early or moderate glaucoma, you can easily combine cataract surgery and subcyclo diode laser. You can decrease the IOP and decrease uh, the number of glaucoma medication. That is good, of course, for the patient. Thank you. Our next speaker is Professor Mark Latina, a clinical professor at the New England Medical Center at Tufts University School of Medicine and staff member of the New England Medical Center. He also holds appointment at the Massachusetts Eye and Ear Infirmary and General Hospitals, as well as the Harvard Medical School in Boston. He is, I'm sure, as needs no introduction, the original inventor of the selective laser trabeculoplasty technique, did a lot of the uh, original uh, laboratory and preparatory work um, demonstrating this technique would work. And so has probably more experience than anyone in the world and longer experience than any of us about how well this technique particularly can fit into our clinical practice. And he's going to talk now about the opportunities for laser therapies within glaucoma to form part of our treatment ladder, treatment escalation, and where they may fit into our, our momentarium. So over to Mark, thank you. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today with, with the, in the LX and Quantel Symposium entitled uh, Glaucoma Laser Assisted Solutions, uh, moving towards a dropless future. Um, my role today is to discuss ranking lasers in glaucoma treatment. Overall, I want to give you a perspective of the role of lasers in glaucoma management. You've heard from uh, Dr. Uh, Gus Gazard on using SLT as primary therapy, and Dr. Aptel on uh, subcyclo photocoagulation. I'll try to give you an overall perspective on what I think, again, the role is of, SL, uh, of various lasers in the treatment uh, regimen uh, and management of glaucoma. My disclosures, uh, I'm an inventor of SLT laser trabeculoplasty, selective laser trabeculoplasty, and a speaker for Quantel Medical. Uh, you know, as we all know, uh, glaucoma management uh, has really taken a traditional stepped approach, looking at the low risk uh, management first to high risk management procedures, uh, such as medications, now followed by laser. Uh, the MIGS procedures, of course, have been inserted here. And there's a plethora of these procedures now. Uh, these are really usually combined with uh, cataract surgery uh, and then conventional incisional surgery, such as trabeculectomy and glaucoma drainage devices. And finally, finally, cyclodestructive procedures, which were reserved primarily for uh, patients with refractor, refractory glaucoma uh, that was really not amenable to treatment uh, by other procedures. So subthreshold lasers are really changing the paradigm. And I, we can call these, I think, minimally invasive laser treatments. 
I think one important point about these procedures is that they are in office procedures. So a lot of the procedures were, you know, that we've discussed or are, are in the management of glaucoma or require us to go to the operating room. Of course, there's selective laser trabeculoplasty, which is now being used as primary therapy. And now the new kid on the block is subcyclodiode laser uh, cyclophotocoagulation, which is of course minimally or non-invasive. And then there's thermal diode cyclophotocoagulation. So the concept of both MIGS and ML, MILT, minimally, minimally invasive laser uh, uh, procedures, are really that we, they, I think they're changing the philosophy of glaucoma surgery. I think the idea now is that we intervene with lower risk procedures earlier in the disease process, reducing morbidity of progression. We wanna reduce the need for more aggressive surgical options, but we wanna preserve those options. I think most importantly, we were trying to reduce medication burden and issues of compliance. And I think that's the goal of this uh, symposium, really use procedures that we can reduce medication burden, but get good IOP control. And all these procedures are really expanding our glaucoma armamentarium. So this is the Vitrace 810 uh, subcyclo uh, unit um, designed by Quantel. It's a no novel, uh, non-destructive cyclophotocoagulation procedure. Uh, Dr. Aptel has gone over this in uh, more in some detail. Uh, just to uh, pictorially uh, demonstrate the difference between standard cyclophotocoagulation or cyclodestructive procedures and subcyclo is shown here. With your conventional uh, diode laser cyclophotocoagulation, we have a continuous beam of energy, which is uh, uh, usually emitting which is emitting energy over a given time period, usually about two seconds. With subcyclo, we basically chop that beam into pulses, allowing for a given power over a shorter period of time with a cooling period. We call this the duty cycle, which in this case is 31.3%, which means that the, the laser is basically on for 31.3% of the time and then off for the remaining time. The result is basically that, uh, that even though this procedure is based on the transscleral cyclophotocoagulation principle, it allows us to selectively treat the ciliary body, reducing aqueous formation really without coagulative necrosis of the ciliary body and also increasing uveoscleral outflow pathway. So it's really working by a different, slightly different mechanism than standard diode laser cyclophotocoagulation. So again, how do, how do we decide when to use laser and what's happening to our stepped approach? Well, this slide is the MC Escher relativity stairs. I guess it's what I'm trying to point out here is that things have become more confusing with the addition of all these lasers and, and, and actually new mix procedures. But I think we need to follow standard principles. And these treatment principles I call the C principles, which are basically the goal of glaucoma treatment is really to maintain uh, patient's visual function and related quality life at a sustainable cost using the safest, easiest, and most effective procedures, basically the lower intraocular pressure to a level that is adequate for the optic nerve and to slow progression, slow or prevent progression. And these are slides from the Canadian Ophthalmology Society. And I think one of the most important aspects of our management are really a formulation of a target IOP. And that is in other words, setting a target IOP uh, based on uh, the disease status of the patient. And they define target IOP as uh, the upper limit of a stable range of measured intraocular pressures deemed likely to retard further optic nerve damage. Um, when setting the target IOP, we like to stage the eye into one to four, one to four severity groups, uh, suspect, early, moderate, or advanced glaucoma based on factors shown here. And I think there's a fine line, of course, between setting an appropriate goal to prevent the optic nerve damage, but also being not, not being overly aggressive in IOP lowering. So they've set this chart up, which I really like, which suggests an upper limit of initial target IOP for, for each eye, uh, shown here based on the stage on the left and the evidence-based medicine shown to different various studies. So ideally, of course, in patients with, uh, with glaucoma who are classified as glaucoma suspects, uh, upper limit of target should be around 20, should be no more than 24 millimeters of mercury. What we'd like to achieve is at least a 20% IOP reduction in those patients who we think need treatment. Early glaucoma, we'd like to see no more than a 20 millimeter upper limit of IOP, and we'd like to achieve a 25% reduction 
And then as we get into more moderate and advanced glaucomas, we like to see lower baseline pressures, lower uh, uh, upper limit pressures of 17 and even 14 millimeters of mercury. And when we're treating these patients, we like to see approximately 30% IOP reduction from baseline. So I've sort of reformulated the treatment options from the EGS guidelines shown here. Initially, of course, are various glaucomas, op open angle glaucoma, PXF, pigmentary, et cetera, where, uh, where medical treatment was used first. Now we're using SLT as primary therapy. And then I think we're at, we are adding subcyclodiode, cyclophotocoagulation, MIGS procedures, incisional surgery, and thermal CPC. Uh, as Dr. Gazard has uh, uh, eloquently discussed in his talk, and uh, this is, I, I think, one of really one of the most important papers that have uh, in contributions to SLT's role in the management of glaucoma is the LIGHT study. And Gus Gazard uh, showed and, and has discussed it. Uh, his study points that selective laser trabeculoplasty should be offered as first-line treatment for open-angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension. And his study really supported a change in clinical practice from using medications as first-line therapy to now using SLT as first-line therapy. And when we look at uh, most of these studies, uh, uh, just a review, this is a slide showing a review of the number of studies and the various percent IOP reductions on, on the x-axis, we see that we can expect, uh, for the most part, to achieve at least a 20 to 25 percent IOP reduction with SLT. So SLT, you know, is you know we're using it in many cases, both as primary therapy and as secondary therapy. Primary therapy may be slightly greater with 25 to 30 percent IOP reduction, but overall, we we expect to see this degree of IOP reduction with SLT. Now, when we look at the MIGS procedures, and there's many many MIGS studies shown here in this very fine print, so it's hard to see, but MIGS, I think we can all agree, are reserved for moderate, mild to moderate gla glaucoma. And you expect, the studies show uh, reductions of 10% to, to up to 40, 40 to 45% IOP reduction. But I think on average, we're achieving about, a, again, a 20 to 25% uh, IOP reduction with these procedures. But they, again, are usually combined with cataract surgery or some other surgical procedure. And they are, for the most part, uh, still require um, an incision and in the operating room. Now, this is some, some studies on subliminal cyclophotocoagulation. Uh, Dr. Aptel has presented his studies with uh, up to 18-month uh, follow-up. These are six-month follow-up studies, but just to give you an idea of the degree of IOP lowering that one might expect to see with subliminal cyclophotocoagulation, this is a 29% reduction of intraocular pressure with a reduction of medications from two medicines to basically 1.6 medications. Uh, in this study, uh, they treated 52 eyes and achieved a 37% IOP reduction with an average of reduction of medications of 18.5%. Uh, there was no pain, no hypotony, and no reduction of best corrected visual acuity in the study. Uh, Dr. Lakhtar uh, also did a study looking at uh, the, uh, the changes, the, looking at the relation of IOP lowering uh, based on uh, based on the Duty, duty cycle of 25% versus 31%. He found that the duty cycle of 31.3% to be more effective, about 85% success rate with an uh, average IOP reduction of 31% with slightly more inflammation compared to 25% duty cycle uh, with a 65% success rate, but less inflammation. And he uh, basically said we should consider uh, using uh, tr treatment-based, uh, using case-by-case -case basis uh, for the various uh, duty cycles. So how would you rank uh, laser? Uh, and I think, again, there's been a paradigm shift here. So initially, of course, uh, this graph basically shows um, IOP lowering, degree of IOP lowering on the, on the horizontal axis with the increasing risk on the vertical axis. Obviously, our goal is to have uh, procedures that are, have good IOP lowering with low risk. Um, Meds, of course, have been usually first-line therapy, but I'm showing here SLT is first-line therapy with uh, adequate IOP lowering in the range of, again, uh, 20 to 25 percent, medications in between. Now, subcyclodiocyclophotocoagulation, which can give us IOP lowerings of greater than 20 
uh, percent IOP reductions on in, in relatively safe procedure. And then thermal diode cyclophotocoagulation, a little bit higher on the list, it's still non-invasive, uh, giving also uh, can give substantial IOP reductions, which I will show, uh, but slightly greater risk. So I've sort of reconfigured our stair, stairway approach or stepped approach. Laser now is first-line therapy, medications, sub-cyclodiode laser cyclophotocoagulation should be considered sort of in the range of the mixed procedures, incisional surgery, and then standard, again, thermal cyclophotocoagulation. What are my diode laser treatment parameters? Well, I always use the 31.3% duty cycle, uh, 2,500 milliwatts of power, and I treat 80 seconds uh, treatment per hemisphere. And I think it's important that uh, we use uh, four 20 second passes. And I think actually the duration of each of pa each pass is an important variable. So I actually don't like to go too fast or too slow, but try to keep it around 20 seconds per pass over the entire hemisphere. And we found that that gives us reasonably good results in IOP reduction without uh, any uh, significant um, uh, complications. So our patient selection for subcyclodiode, uh, usually these patients are on medical therapy. Many of them have had prior uh, selective lesion trabeculoplasty. We're treating both early uh, to moderate glaucoma as well as more refractory glaucomas with subcyclodiode. Uh, many have even had prior surgical procedures or are willing to have a glaucoma surgical procedure. And they can have good vision. So we're actually treating uh, patients with really um, visions that are actually 20-20 vision and they require uh, lower pressures and not responsive to other therapies or do not want other therapies. And we've been using the, this uh, procedure with good success. Just quickly, a little bit about thermal diode cyclophotocoagulations. This is the G-probe de designed by Dr. Gastelum many years ago, uh, placed really directly on the sclera, but uh, designed to treat directly treat the ciliary body, uh, causing a, basically a thermal necrosis of the ciliary body. Uh, most of the studies on transcleral diode cyclophotocoagulation have been in refractory glaucoma. Uh, and what we see is actually relatively good and significant IOP reductions in the range of 25 to really up to 50% reduction with probably averages between 35 and 40% IOP reductions with uh, standard transcleral diode laser. Um, when to use thermal diode laser cyclophotocoagulation? Well, again, I, we still use this primarily in these refractive uh, glaucomas where other glaucoma treatments have failed. Uh, patients who are poor candidates for other incisional uh, procedures, and that obviously holds for subcyclophotocoagulation. I use it, um, and I think it's actually the procedure of choice for patients who are actually post glaucoma uh, shunt procedures with poor IOP control. So we have many patients with glaucoma shunts and uh, they require lower intraocular pressure. I found that using a diode laser cyclophotocoagulation, either the thermal G-probe or subcyclo can be used. And these are very effective at reducing uh, the intraocular pressure in those patients because those patients really just require reduction in aqueous uh, production so that the valve works better and we've had excellent success. And again, these, uh, uh, these lasers can be used in eyes with relatively good vision, but of course, uh, thermal diode has a slightly greater risk of reduction of, of vision reduction than subcyclo diode. So what are the benefits uh, and really role of subliminal cyclophotocoagulation? Well, I think it's, a, again, it's a more gentle cyclophotocoagulation procedure. I think it's as, as efficient as thermal cyclophotocoagulation with similar IOP reductions. It does preserve the ciliary body structures. It does improve UV scleral outflow. It's safe and can be repeated. And it really allows us for earlier intervention uh, in, in, the, in the treatment regimen. So we're treating early to moderate glaucoma with this procedure, patients with good vision and good visual potential. potential. And I would consider it much like a MIGS type procedure. So in conclusion, where to rank uh, laser and glaucoma management. Again, I think we should change our paradigm. We should use SLT as primary therapy. We should consider subcyclodiode laser treatments earlier in the glaucoma management. And I think this, these procedures are safe and effective as an early treatment for glaucoma. Uh, thank you very much. So thanks very much indeed, everyone, for listening to the three talks that we've had. 
we've heard from Florent, Mark and myself about the role that different forms of laser, um, very uh, low energy, uh, low energy fluence, low energy density lasers, both to the ciliary body or to the trabecular meshwork, and the impact that both those can have on interocular pressure control in a safe, controlled, predictable, coordinated manner. I think that the, the future of um, medication drop use in, in glaucoma treatment is limited. I think that there are now uh, many uh, alternatives to daily medication um, for the reasons that you've heard from, from this symposium. And I think there are very exciting times ahead of us where uh, laser, repeat laser, and then perhaps more surgical laser after the initial SLT treatment, may, there may well come a time when we don't need to inflict daily dosage of medications on our patients at all, or in, perhaps just very rarely. So thank you very much indeed for your time today. Um, and if you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to get in touch with either Quantel, uh, myself or the other speakers, if you have any particular queries about the content of today's lectures. Thank you.